This is Robert Kraft, and I'm your host for the Planet Microcap Showcase Virtual Investor Conference 2020. And I'm here right now to introduce you to our very first panel of the day. It's our legal panel titled COVID-19 Legal Ramifications for Small Companies. Uh, on our panel joining us today, our moderator, Jim Jenkins from Harder Seacrest Emory. And then our panelists are Laura Anthony from Anthony LG PLLC. Lou Bevilacqua from Bevilacqua PLLC, and Lynn Bullduck from Fitzgerald Yap Creditor. I'd also like to thank our sponsors for this panel. It's Harder Seacrest Emery, Bevilacqua PLLC, Anthony LG PLLC, and Fitzgerald Yap Creditor. So real quick before I throw to Jim right now, uh, I'd just like to give you a quick background on our uh, moderator, Jim Jenkins. He is a partner at Harder Seacrest Emery. Uh, he represents clients in corporate governance and general corporate law and securities laws matters, uh, including initial and secondary public offerings, private placements, mergers and acquisitions, and securities law compliance. Uh, Jim is the practice leader of Harder Seacrest and Emory's securities practice area and is the partner in charge of the firm's New York City office. He continues to serve as general counsel to a number of publicly traded and private equity backed companies. So with that, I'd like to throw it to Jim to uh, kick off this panel and uh, please enjoy. Thanks so much. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's been uh, quite a few weeks for everyone, I think, uh, as we try to adapt to the new normal. Um, uh, and we've got some interesting things to talk about here and over the next 50 minutes or so. Um, and I wanna thank our panel for being here. And I think I'm gonna start with introductions. Um, uh, first, uh, we have Lynn Baldock. Um, Lynn started working at, uh, as an in-house uh, lawyer at uh, several investment banks. Uh, she has now been a corporate and securities transactional attorney for 25 years and has structured and advised on more than $1 billion worth of financings and business transactions, particularly private and public offerings and mergers and acquisitions. She is a partner at Fitzgerald Yap Creditor LLP in Irvine, California, a business transaction and litiga litigation law firm founded over 35 years ago. Uh, Laura Anthony. Laura is the founding partner of Anthony LG PLLC, a national corporate securities and business transaction law firm. For 23 years, Ms. Anthony has focused her law practice on small and mid-cap private and public companies, the OTC market, NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, MKT, going public transactions, mergers and acquisitions, private placement and corporate finance transactions, and, and the like. Uh, Lou Bevel, finally, Lou Bevelacqua. Uh, Mr. Bevelacqua is the founding partner of Bevelacqua PLLC, a boutique transactional corporate and securities law firm. Mr. Bevelacqua counsels companies of every size, ranging from entrepreneurs with just an idea to established companies whose securities trade on the NYSE or NASDAQ. He has broad experience representing issuers, in public offerings, and private placements of securities, including private placements under 506C of the Securities Act, crowdfunding offerings under Title III of the Jobs Act and Regulation CF and Regulation A plus offerings. Exchange Act compliance, angel and venture capital financings, other areas of equity and debt financing and mergers and acquisitions. Mr. Bebelaka was previously a partner in the corporate securities group of Pillsbury, Winthrop, Shaw, Pittman, LLP, and is also the co-founder of Digital Offering LLC, an SEC registered broker dealer and FINRA member and previously served as president and general counsel. And uh, folks, I'm thrilled to be with you. Um, frankly, as I look at this I, and I add up the years, uh, there's well over 100 years of experience uh, sitting at the table with me or virtually at the table with me. And I thank you all for coming. Our topic today um, is one that I'm sure we're, is, is the reason we're all sitting here. Uh, and that is uh, COVID-19, um, its impacts on small companies, uh, particularly the types of companies that um, uh, the lawyers on this panel represent. Um, I think we'll start with sort of anecdotal, you know, what's, what are we seeing out there? I might start with Lynn and just ask her, you know, what kind of uh, sort of transactions you've handled during the pandemic and how they've gone. Sure. I had three acquisitions pending when the pandemic hit, one of which closed on April 1st. It was a $50 million sale of a private company. Um, the buyer insisted upon a $350,000 COVID-19 adjustment to the purchase price. 
my seller accepted that just to get the deal done in these you know, times of turmoil. So that one did close, albeit with a $350,000 haircut. The other two acquisitions were put on hold to May and June respectively. I was also working on two IPOs, one of which, a Reg A+, was about to go effective, but the underwriter put it on hold until June. The second IPO, Regular Way S1 registration, is moving forward, and the underwriter is scheduling a virtual roadshow in May. So that's new and different. We are working on several private placements. Um, the real estate private placements have been put on hold due to trouble getting financing. However, we are working on one private placement that's for a hand sterilizer product, and that one's doing better than ever. So, and I predict what we may see is what I saw back in the Great Recession in 2007. We saw fewer IPOs because people didn't trust the markets, they were too volatile, but we had more private offerings than ever at that time because people still wanted and needed to invest their money. So that may happen here in the coming months. Well, from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> um, how, about, how about other panelists? What are you seeing out there? Uh, Lou, could you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think one of the things that uh, we're seeing is a lot of our companies are looking at their agreements, whether they're debt covenants or other things like that, and um, trying to be proactive about it. Um, so for example, if they know that there's gonna be a potential payment default, maybe uh, figuring out how to get bridge financing to cover it, or at least reaching out to the lender. You know, uh, assets are depreciating in a lot of cases, and uh, there's less income and revenue, so they might be tripping, you know, some financial covenants. So, you know, things like that are coming up, and, and they're going to want to speak to their lenders proactively and, and try to deal with that. Same is true for other material contracts. You know, is there a force majeure event? Do we need to get out of a contract? Um, so, you know, there's multiple things like that. Um, one of the things that I think is pretty interesting, um, there are companies that have ongoing offerings and then when the pandemic started, they came up with either a new product or a new service offering that relates to COVID-19 and they announced it. And one of the things that it seems that SEC as enforcement is doing is being very careful about these announcements in, in light of, you know, the pandemic where people might be trying to take advantage, uh, saying that they have some product or service related to COVID-19 that's gonna increase their sales, et cetera, when it's really not the case. And so uh, it, it seems that enforcement is taking it very seriously. Uh, they're reaching out to companies who mention COVID-19 uh, you know, as, as a new product or service offering, and they're trying to make sure that it's, it's legit. So uh, you should be very careful yeah. And, and accurate when you disclose any new product or, uh, or service offering related to COVID-19. You know, the SEC, that's an interesting point. I'm going to get to Laura in a second, but the SEC, um, uh, I guess my experiences back in the old Ebola days, uh, felt as though people had taken advantage of, uh, uh, of that, quote, opportunity with investors and uh, engaged in a great deal of puffery. So I think... Um, watching them wave those red flags again is something I, I think uh, we all should be aware of. I think it's a very good point. Definitely. Um, Laura, maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, how things are working uh, in your neck of the woods and how, uh, you know, uh, what the deal flow looks like. Yeah. So it, they, uh, none of my deals that were ongoing have stopped as a result of the pandemic. We filed two Form 1As last week. We filed an S1 and that's an underwritten offering with uh, that's an uplifting and that's proceeding forward. Uh, I have a few other Form 1As in the works right now. We're doing follow-on offerings and takedowns on S3s. None of that has slowed down and none of the deals were put on hold because of the pandemic. For the first couple of weeks, I did notice that there, a lot of people were in shock and I think that uh, taking stock of, of what's gonna happen and I didn't see a lot of business movement. Interestingly, in the last two weeks, I'm getting a lot of inquiries for companies that are interested in going on to the OTC markets. 
So they're thinking, it's in the, and good companies, solid companies with good revenues that would normally be looking at an underwritten offering onto an exchange. And I think that they're looking at this as, as let me go public anyway. Don't worry about a bigger offering. Get used to being public. And when the capital markets pick back up, they'll be in a prime place to uplift. So I've seen a lot of like significant companies looking at inquiries on OTC markets, which I find interesting. Business hasn't stopped though, that's for sure. I mean, obviously some of my clients are taking bigger hits than others and anybody in, in medical care or consumer products like hand sanitizers or anything like that is doing very well. Technology companies, especially technology related to retail online businesses are doing very well, but you know, business is still going on. So I'm, I'm very optimistic that, you know, we're going to just find our way through this. You know, it's interesting. And I, 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 you know, we're in my firm, we're sort of experiencing the same as you guys. I think it, um, I, maybe, I, you know, maybe this is a little bit of a bold prediction, but I do feel as though that, um, sort of the industry segment of securities law uh, uh, segment that we find ourselves in seems to be relatively recession proof. And I guess that's because uh, in a lot of ways people need money and whether that means that that comes in the form of dilutive capital, which frankly I'm starting to see more of, I don't know if you guys are, but the valuations are obviously very different than they were even six to eight weeks ago. Um, and so we're, we're seeing some of that. Um, we're obviously scrambling. I think, as Lou had said, we're we're doing a lot of what you're doing, Lou, on the on the covenant side. Uh, we're seeing a lot of flexibility with banks. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone else has seen that, but I think uh, banks have been far more flexible uh, uh, in this context than I've seen them in others. Um, and uh, and so that that that's uh, that's been been helpful. You know that. I'm on the board of a, of a hazmat suit manufacturing company. So we're obviously struggling to get as much out as we possibly can uh, at this point. And one of the interesting things is that our year end, um, we had audit issues. We, we have inventory and getting our auditors to physically review the inventory. They ended up bringing drones in um, to actually analyze our, our inventory. So, um, uh, so uh, you know, there, there, there is a new normal here that's a, it's a little uh, weird getting used to. Um, but um, you know, you're right. I think the SEC is open for business. I think the capital markets are still open for business, um, and that's good news for us, and it's good news for our clients. Um, so with that, I think what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, there's there's been a lot of regulatory, um, um, you know, lots of regulatory guidance that the staff at the SEC has uh, uh, ha has sort of fomented. You know, it started in January, right? I mean, we had uh, we had Chairman Clayton come out with a statement very late January about COVID, and here we are, flash forward, and there were several orders that have uh, have come out since then, um, and even recent guidance, um, Laura, I believe, uh, on topic nine, just just as recently as two days ago. Uh, and I'm wondering if you, uh, Laura, wouldn't mind walking us through a little bit on on uh, on what guidance nine sort of means from a disclosure perspective, and then I would I would everyone else want to jump in, go right ahead, but. Sure. So topic nine was issued by the Division of Corporation Finance. And so it is a more formal guidance. In addition, as you noted, the SEC has been saying a lot informally, including through a public statement by Chair Jay Clayton and the Director of Corporation Finance, William Hinman. But topic nine, it, it, listen, it, it, no doubt people are going to have to be making COVID-19 related disclosures for in a, a time period in the future. This is going to have impact, not just during this quarantine and lockdown, but for several years to come. And so the SEC is, is addressing how people are, are going to be looking at, it with a principle-based principle approach, what they're going to need to disclose. And disclosures will be in Qs and Ks and 8Ks, and it'll include, uh, it, it'll be in the management discussion analysis, the business section, risk factors, legal proceedings, uh, disclosure controls and procedures, internal controls over financial reporting and the financial statements of, uh, themselves, of course. So topic 19, keeping, uh, topic nine, I'm sorry, keeping in mind that, you know, that this overarching area uh, lays out some things for management to consider when they're fashioning their disclosures. And so I'm just going to go through some of those. And that is that uh, how has COVID-19 impacted the financial condition and the results of operations? And how does a company expect it to impact their future operating results? 
both in the near and long term in their financial condition? Do they expect that COVID-19 will impact future operations differently than how it's impacted the current period? So what, you know, there obviously some businesses are shut down completely, but, but then they're going to reopen and what will be that continuing and future impact? How COVID-19 impacts capital and financial resources, including overall liquidity and the outlook for future liquidity, considering the cost or access of capital and funding sources and whether that's changed and whether it's likely to continue to change. Have sources and uses of cash been materially impacted? Has the ability to continue to meet ongoing credit arrangements and contractual arrangements as Lou was bringing up? Has that been materially impacted? Those would require disclosures. Uh, the, the actions that the company is taking or proposes to take to address these impacts and the financial impacts, how has COVID affected assets and asset value is currently on the balance sheet. Market capitaliz capitalizations have gone down, but the actual value of assets and inventory that a company has may be impacted. Both have gone down and then for some companies have increased. And uh, what is the fair value of your assets? So a company has to consider all of those things material impairments to contracts, material impairments to intangible assets, including goodwill, uh, rights to use assets or investment securities, um, increases in allowances for credit loss and restructuring charges. Again, that goes back to the contractual and restructuring. And so the company has to really consider and make disclosures on all of, the, all of those impacts. Uh, how, oh, and another important one is how the COVID-19 related circumstances such as the remote work arrangements have adversely affected the ability to maintain operations, to, to find uh, how it's uh, affected financial reporting systems, internal controls over financial reporting and disclosure controls and customer relationships. How has it impacted your customer and supplier relationships and how will it continue to impact those relationships? What challenges is a company uh, uh, facing currently in their continuity plans and how will those continuity plans have to be changed? Um, do you expect COVID-19 to materially impact the demand for your products or services? That's a given, of course, people need to consider that and make disclosures on that, supply chains, delivery chains, and all aspects of operations human capital resources and productivity. And finally, another example the SEC gave in topic nine is our travel restrictions and border cl closures expected to have a material impact on the company's ability to operate and achieve their business goals. As mentioned, there's also been informal guidance, but I'll, I'll let somebody else talk. And then if you want to ask me about that, I'll talk about that as well. Well, you know, I mean, there's a, you, you've touched on a lot of interesting topics. Um, you know, and uh, I think I think the, the the overall guiding message here, I think, from the staff at the SEC is the law continues to apply. Okay, I mean, we've got public health uh, and safety issues out there uh, first and foremost, obviously, but the law continues to apply. And I think Lou reminded us of that as we started this off with enforcement's attitude. Um, but uh, you know, there's also been some regulatory relief. Um, I don't know whether Lynn or Lou, if you want to talk about that, I'm certainly uh, happy to sort of pile on a little bit with Laura. It's entirely up to you two. Feel free to pile on. Okay, or so, so, so <laughs> one, one of the things I guess one of the things I'll say is is the uh, you know sort of the the extended dot deadlines. Um, you know what I you know my one of my partners called it uh, uh, 12 b 25 on on steroids. Um, <laughs> you know and and. Uh, um, so, and I'm not sure if any of you are, have started down that road with your clients in terms of filing sort of your COVID-8 case. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So maybe you could, you could walk us Many. through, which, maybe, uh, you know, Lou, why don't you walk us through a little bit with uh, some of those experiences? Well, yeah, I mean, basically you have to file an 8K as opposed to just a 12B25 and explain the reasons why you need the extension and there has to be actually a real reason for it. Um, I, I note um, that it also applies to Reg A issuers who, um, I think that came out more recently. It did. Um, and, and, and so, you know, the uh, annual reports are coming due for uh, December 31 year end companies at the end of April, I believe. So, um, you know, that could help them as well. And uh, so, I, I mean, I think it's great. I mean, these companies are really suffering a lot of times for the reasons um, that Laura mentioned that maybe they can't get the auditor can't get in to count inventory or something like that. So there's real reasons why these companies need extensions. And if you don't file your 8K, especially if you're a larger company that's S3 eligible 
and you know you don't have that kind of extension, uh, you you might lose your S three eligibility or other things, which can be devastating for a company. So um, I'm really happy to see that the SEC came out with that relief. And and Lynn, as I understand it, I think these only apply these apply to uh, our Exchange Act documents, but exclude 13Ds and Form Fours. So I don't know if people are reminding their clients that um, you know we we've you know, we've got to pay attention to that. That's still something, um, you know, we, we, we don't get an extension on. Um, and I guess it, it would apply also in theory to an 8K, although I, I, I don't really understand as I look at that, I don't know whether you guys have run across a situation where, for instance, you've got a, uh, you know, uh, an amendment to a material agreement or you've got an impairment that, you, uh, that you, want to, uh, you want to take early and you'd have to file an 8K. But in order to do that, you have to file an 8K for the extension. So it'd be awful weird to be arguing that you can't file an 8K, but you're gonna file an 8K to say you can't file an 8K. Yeah, it <laughs> seems like an 8K, there's usually a triggering event and you file it. Um, with, the, with the annual reports and quarterly reports, you have third parties involved who have to do things like auditors. So, you know, the delay could relate to that because they can't do their job for some COVID-19 related issue. Um, so, so Laura, you had you had uh, sort of run us down the road here a little bit with um, with guidance nine. I, I do wonder, uh, or uh, topic nine. I want, I do wonder if you want to go a little bit further into some of the experiences. I mean, may, maybe you guys are finding this now as you're starting to draft your exchange act reports. Uh, what it is you're putting in those reports, and Lynn, feel free to to chime in as well along with Laura. I just would want to get a handle on um, what this talented group is uh, is seeing. Uh, and advising vis-a-vis -vis their their clients um, uh, as they as they encounter these disclosure issues. I want to make one sure. point I along with Laura's dissertation earlier that companies need to realize these things can't be generic. They have to be specific. It has to relate to your business and your industry and how it has affected you. I'm seeing a lot of smaller companies just throw in a generic COVID-19 <laughs> risk factor, and that doesn't fly. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, and why do I think when, when Exchange Act uh, documents get pulled in the next 12 months, uh, we're going to get a lot of scrutiny from the staff because, because mm -hmm. someone decided to just do a cut and paste. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no shortcuts. Right. In fact, the SEC, and you know, I mentioned some informal guidance, and in particular, uh, Chair Clayton and William Hinman did a public statement, but Chair Clayton has also been on CNBC and, and other national news organizations. And they are actively encouraging disclosure, disclosure, disclosure now, even though it, the companies don't even know what is going to happen. They want companies to be out there filing 8Ks and press releases, telling the world how they're being impacted today and how that and how they're addressing that impact today and reminding companies that they have safe harbors for forward-looking statements under both the uh, Ex uh, Securities Act and Exchange Act and as well as uh, common law and they're reminding companies to avail themselves put in the disclaimers and make those disclosures and they've gone so far as to say as long as the disclosures are made in good faith providing information they will not be second-guessed by the SEC, so they've gone that far, and, and they're really pushing for just get as much information out there as you can. And that's not just because of investors, that's gonna help give some confidence to suppliers and, and people in business with these companies in general, and hopefully help the economy as it's gonna struggle in the future. But you know, it's all about disclosure while following the law. I mean, if you're gonna use non-GAAP numbers, of course you have to comply with the rules related to non-GAAP numbers and, and any other rules, but, but get that information out there as much as you can, even if it's drips and drabs and unclear, get it out there and file those AKs. Um, has anybody run across S3 eligibility issues with some of this transitional, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, relief that we're getting from the SEC in terms of the currency of their of their S3? Just curious. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. The, the, uh, I was the just going to say I haven't. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, the guidance specifically says that you maintain your S3 eligibility if you filed your COVID-19 extension 8K and as long as you file your 10K within the time period allowed. 
So we are continuing, like, continuing to do takedowns off of Best Breeze for two companies that have filed the extension and the, you know, the, obviously we're filed, making our filings. So, you know, and those companies will make their deadline on the 10K with the 45 days. So, so turning just to br briefly a bit, and, and we'll, I'm going to get to some corporate governance issues I want to ask of Lou, but I want to ask, sort of ask the group, um, you know, have you, have you had the directors come to you yet about uh, showing support for the stock and wanting to buy um, when your, when your insider trading uh, uh, policy prohibits it at this point? Because you, uh, because we're, we're, I'm running across a lot of pressure from directors who you know, I have to, I have to uh, forcefully sometimes remind them that we're, in a, we're, we're not in a window period. And while you want, may want to support the stock, you're going to have to wait. Anyone run across that? No. I'm, yeah, I'm seeing it less from the directors, although I could see why that would, directors and officers, why that would come up. I'm, I'm seeing it more from companies. I mean, sometimes the pandemic, uh, most times probably negatively affects the company. Uh, other times the company is stable or even doing better because it has a, a pandemic, a, a product that's useful in the pandemic. Um, so all companies' stock prices seem to be down. So it could be a good time to buy in the market if you're, if you're an issuer. Um, I think uh, Goldman Sachs put out a report though saying about 50, you know, stock repurchases are down about 50% right. this year which of course creates, in addition to the general volatility in the market, having no stock repurchase program from a company that is normally out there buying back its stock, you know, that creates additional volatility in that stock. Uh, but on the other hand, if you have the cash and your stock is low, uh, it may be a good time to buy. You do need to keep in mind though that some of these government programs um, will not give you the grant money that you're looking for if you are in the market buying back your stock. They just something they don't want to happen. Um, so you know it's 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 interesting. Uh, companies yes, Lulu, buying back stock is as evil as paying executives, I believe. Exactly. I God forbid. <laughs> but uh, you know you, you see even some of these bigger companies. You know of course their focus is on maintaining their dividend. And I work with micro cap companies, so I don't come across this as much. But I did note that. Uh, you know, Intel, for example, has suspended its buyback program and it's, you know, they, and, and companies like that are doing that. They maintain the dividend if they can, but they suspend the buyback program in this market. Better, better use for, uh, for the money. Interesting. I mean, I think, I think a lot of, again, I, rep, I represent a large number of micro caps as well. And so I'm not, um, I, I haven't seen a lot of the stock repurchase action historically anyway. Um, uh, but it is, uh, you know, it is something that, that's out there and you've got all these loan programs um, that we're still sort of digesting, I think, as lawyers for our clients because they haven't, we, the Treasury Department hasn't given us a lot of clarity, nor has, nor has the Fed yet, on how these are really going to work. Um, some of my uh, clients have, uh, have been applying for the payroll protection plan as well. And it's, it, that's equally uh, as, as frustrating, I think, in terms of being able to get the money. Um, but I do, I do wonder whether, um, you know, the, uh, the lack of flexibility on stock buyback and on executive comp, um, you know, unless you're desperate for the money, may, may just make folks decide that they don't want to go down that road. Um, and not to mention, I think, Lou, you had, you had already talked about the interplay with the, you know, the, you're dealing with a bank right now, you're trying to renegotiate your financial covenants. I'm not even actually sure how that's going to interplay with some of the federal monies that are going to be available. Um, right. And I'm not sure if anyone's had any experience yet with that, but um, I'm, I'm certain that we're all getting calls from our clients on how can we find how can we find more money to the extent that's out there. Yeah. Um, you know, Lynn, do you want to talk a little bit about? Um, I mean, are, are you're talking about transactional work. How about the M&A activity? Have you seen Have you seen much? Are you Are you still? Uh, I mean, my my experiences have been, um, you know, uh, the valuations have been dramatically changed and. Um, uh, everyone has sort of moved to the right to figure out what's going to happen first before they uh, necessarily close. Now, having said that, I am closing a deal tomorrow, um, and uh, it's with pri private equity-backed deals. So, you know, deals are getting done, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, but I'd like to get a handle from you guys on how you're, what you're seeing out there on the M&A side. What I'm seeing is I thought the sort of the liquidated damages clause that occurred in the example I gave earlier 
to the $50 million deal, that was sort of interesting. They decided in advance how much they were gonna haircut the purchase price for the current pandemic. I also do worry about the earnout because sellers will, it will affect the earnout provisions. I also worry a bit about indemnification issues. I don't need a buyer coming back trying to seek indemnification for claims that arise during this period. Good point. It's a very good point. Um, switching a little bit, uh, and I, I would offer anyone to sort of uh, what what they're what you're seeing out there. Um, boards that I've been counseling have been quite active, uh, meeting quite more frequently than we have in in. Uh, you know, and you know, it's, we're not just meeting quarterly. How about that? We're having a lot of uh, phone interaction uh, over, you know, uh, crisis management, I might call it. Wondering what you guys are seeing out there, whether you're seeing any shareholder activism. Look, we're in a micro cap space. Um, we're probably our, uh, where we are. A lot of our clients were probably undervalued anyway. Um, and so the real issue is if they're, un if they were undervalued before this and they took a 15% to 20% drop as a result of the market dropping. You know, what are you seeing out there? What are you, what are you, what are you doing in the way of counseling, Lou? Um, I think in, in my case, what we're seeing is things happening really quickly for companies, much more quickly, you know, on the good side, especially if they have a product that relates to COVID-19, which one of my clients does. It's just craziness. I mean, things are changing so quickly that it's very hard to schedule and have a board meeting, especially if you have a real board with five or seven members. And so what they're doing is, you know, picking one of their committees, like an audit committee, and saying, okay, you're gonna be the emergency committee and the CEO is gonna have an open line to you. And if we can't call a board meeting quick enough or a phone call quick enough, you know, you can make the decision for the whole board. So those kinds of things are, are helpful to CEOs who are, trying to make decisions quickly. And on the negative side, the same thing's happening, right? You may be thinking about a reduction in force. Um, you may want to terminate a material contract before some triggering event happens that makes you lose more money. And so decisions have to be made quickly and you need the board to be flexible and you know, doing it through a committee seems to help. Yeah, that's, I, 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 we have seen a lot of delegations, sort of a creation of an executive committee in a lot of ways. Uh, to your point, Luce, to, to sort of uh, move a little more quickly, react a little more quickly. Um, and so I'm seeing that particularly in the seven to nine board member size and in the, in the five member board, you know, they're all sort of acting together and, and moving as quickly as they can. Um, uh, Lynn and Laura, how about you? Something interesting that just occurred to your point about taking advantage of low valuations. I have a client on NASDAQ and they've been a public company for 23 years. Two weeks ago, they called me and said they're going to take the company private. Yep. Yep, you're right. I've, uh, and in fact, that's a discussion that uh, several boards are having. Uh, you know, to the extent that you've got the capital available, um, you know, this is not a terrible time to have that consideration. Um, you know, when you're talking about, um, let's all face it, um, none of us have, are come cheap. <laughs> and it's expensive being public. Um, so, uh uh, I, I would I would agree with you. I think uh, that's probably something we might see uh, uh, unfold. Um, uh, I also think we're going to see. I mean, I and I don't. I'd be interested to see listen to what uh, the panel might might think about this. But I think we're going to see some um, an uptick of uh, uh, of M and A activity, sort of a Darwinian kind of a thing. You know, the folks that have the cash uh, and have solid balance sheets are going to be in a position to uh, to do some things, and folks that aren't are not are going to be. Uh, are going to be those that are bought in all likelihood and uh i i think we're already experiencing that to some degree in some of the areas that i'm i find um some of the industries that uh the, the sort of my clients reside in um not all of them are great i mean i anybody represent any retailers out there i, I do not. i have several retailer clients uh how, yeah how and i i agree there will be there will be an uptick in m a but so far, none of my clients are panicking. They all are like, okay, everybody's stock price is down. I'm not going to worry too much about mine, and this is going to pass. Well, that's a good attitude. I, I, you know, I, I, you know, no one knows, no one has a crystal ball yet on how this is going to, going to end up. But, um, but I would be interested in, um, you know, on the corporate governance end, I, I, you know, I have told, I, I've got at least two or three clients now who have had 
activist shareholders in the past who have sort of gone away, um, but there is some concern at the board level. And so consequently, we are seeing an increase anyway of sort of um, dusting off the old poison pill. Uh, and I don't know whether you guys are running across that or not. It doesn't come up that much in my practice, to be yeah. honest. Uh, but, you know, I could see why that would make a lot of sense yeah. if your yeah. stock is down and you don't feel like you have the shareholder support, um, you know, now's the time to dust that off and take a look. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, have you guys sort of developed sort of a checklist for your clients as you as they sort of go through uh, this um, this confusing time? Um, we are we are starting to, and I and I, I think someone had already suggested that not one size fits all in this uh, in this battle. Um, but just a little curious as to how you sort of uh, what kind of counseling you're giving to clients, and um, you know what what direction they're looking for from you. I, I, I'll be honest, I haven't been this busy, at, you know, at least our group in, a, in quite a long time. Um, and anyway, we were pretty busy to begin with. And of course, you, you layer in being remote and uh, that adds a special set of circumstances as well. So just curious as to, you know, maybe Lynn or Lou and then, the, you know, uh, Laura, you could sort of give us some of your experiences of late. I'm working with a lot of clients to re-examine and perhaps renegotiate their force majeure clauses, the clauses that excuse non-performance of a contract. When the whole pandemic first hit, of course, all the conferences were canceled and I represent a lot of clients in the conference business, including this one. <laughs> and so we can't hold our conference. Does our existing force majeure clause let us out of it? It says acts of God or acts of nature. It doesn't say worldwide health pandemic. So that was being looked at and- So rather, Linda, are you suggesting I can have a, re I get a refund? I'm kidding. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> they still, they're not even refunding my hotel fees. <laughs> but back 20 years ago, when I first started practicing terrorism, acts of terrorism were not included in the laundry list of events that you find in these clauses. And now they're commonplace. So mm -hmm. now, clients, my corporate clients are putting pandemic as one of the events in their laundry list for their force majeure clauses for the future. So I think we're going to see that become commonplace for the future. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree. Yeah, I agree. I, um, you know, you asked whether we have a checklist. I think it's a great idea. Um, we haven't gotten around to putting together <laughs> a formal checklist, I'll just be honest, but we are talking to our clients on a regular basis. And one of the things we're talking to them about is, you know, remember you're an, for the SEC reporting companies, you're an SEC reporting company. And if certain things happen, they may happen quickly and you don't have time to think about them and you may have to file an 8K for them. So, you know, things like has the, uh, has the CEO or any other key executive contracted uh, COVID-19? If so, do you need to file an 8K? Well, maybe not if they just contracted it, but if they have to delegate their duties to somebody else, then maybe yes. Um, and maybe maybe even if you don't have to file it, you should just to get ahead of the market uh, because there may be rumors or speculation about things like that. Um, you know, you, you're, you're in a rush to get bridge financing uh, because, you know, revenue's down, income's down. And so you're raising capital. Remember, every time you raise capital, even if it's a small bridge loan, you may have to file an 8K you're gonna terminate people because you're, you're going through a reduction in force. You know, that may be another reason why you have to do a filing. Or things like, you know, you're talking with your auditors and unfortunately your assets have to be impaired. Well, that's gonna trigger an AK. Um, so there's lots of different triggers, uh, including, you know, relating to stock prices. If you're a NASDAQ or NYSC listed company, and your price goes below a dollar for 30 days. and you're gonna get a letter from the exchange. I'm not sure, actually, maybe somebody on the panel knows, uh, you know, whether, yeah. whether uh, any of the exchanges have, uh, you know, put that on hold for now, but, you know, th th that's another thing to think about, at least. I, I do, NAS, both NASDAQ and NYSE are giving temporary relief. Uh, NYSE actually sought uh, a rule change with the SEC, a temporary rule change. NASDAQ is doing it informally, but they're giving temporary relief for not only stock price, but market cap. So if your market cap falls below the required continued listing market cap level for your company, depending on what tier you're on, they're giving temporary relief for that as well. 
or the MISC again is doing it as more of a formal rule change. NASDAQ is just saying that they're going to consider the impact and how long your uh, market cap or stock price stays down before they're going to take any action. So there has been some release on that. But uh, on the checklist, Great idea. Haven't done it yet. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I feel better now. It, you know, the sad thing is, 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 is what, what often happens at a firm like mine is we'll have a checklist put together. By the time we get it done, the whole damn thing will be over. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. you know, it, it's funny, though, Lou, you made, you made that comment on, on, um, on impairment. Um, you know, my experiences with asset impairment has always been, it's one of those things that you know, you do when you're doing the 10K, you know, at the end of the year, you, you sit down and say, geez, should we, should we, should we take an impairment charge? Right. Um, but I will tell you, you know, we're filing a case now for, for impairment uh, uh, charges that I just, I, I, you know, I always thought, wow, that's kind of a silly um, item because for the most part, it's something you usually take care of at the end of the year. Right. Uh, but more and more, that's becoming something that's, uh, you know, uh, we're seeing. It's just an unusual time. I mean, if it's an asset that uh, had value and now, you know, it's, the value is decimated, you better disclose it sooner rather than later. Because if your stock price uh, moves up or down, someone's going to look to see what happened and say, why didn't you disclose it sooner? It's material. Exactly. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but I'm sorry. Nope. Nothing. I just was agreeing. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's... Uh, um, has anybody got anyone out there who um, who gives guidance uh, in any of their press releases? Um, because all of ours are yeah. withdrawn. <laughs> that, that, that's another huge area for sure, yeah. Because um, <laughs> your guidance is either you're doing better than you should be or you're doing worse than you should be. But most people aren't doing where they thought they aren't going where they thought they would go. So it's probably a good idea to update the guidance. Well, you know, interesting. And, and even if you're doing better than you thought you were, uh, some folks have supply chain issues, right? I mean, you're, you're, uh, you've got so much out there that's uh, a, a demand for your product. And unfortunately, some of it is raw material that comes from Vietnam or China or India. And hey, guess what? We can't get it. Yeah, I'm advising all my clients to review the guidance if they've already issued 2020 guidance to see whether or not it needs to be withdrawn or amended. But my NASDAQ, my exchange traded companies are all issuing guidance just like they used to. And we're just discussing discussing to the, the greatest impact that we can what is going on and what impact COVID has had on them. And, and you know, so uh, it, so far, none of them have been decimated by it. So that's the good news. But you know, we're, we're talking about it in depth with them all the time. Yeah, no, it's uh, um, interesting times, uh, I guess we would, one would say. Uh, how about annual meetings this year, guys? Um, uh, you know, we, most of our clients have gone to virtual anyway. Um, just curious how, uh, you know, how that's gone for you and uh, during proxy season. I guess our clients virtual. have meetings later in the year, but I suspect they're all going to be virtual, and, and most of them already are. Yeah, and most of the states are providing for it now anyway. Um, uh, the People's Republic of New York even gave us some, some uh, break with, uh, with people. So, um, uh, but yeah, I just, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty much through uh, our proxy season, although we do have issuers that are in, uh, registrants that, are, that have uh, year ends in May. Uh, that we may, we may run up against. Um, you know, anybody seeing, you know, to Lou's point about the, um, uh, uh, the, the creditors, law, large credit draws that are being made? Uh, anybody, any, other, any of your clients have just gone out there and decided to just draw 80, 90% of it, whatever's eligible, so they have the cash? I had a client yesterday uh, make a draw request on their line of credit. They're in the real estate business and they actually construct hotels, Marriott's and Hilton's, and they're a giant company of 3,000 employees. They went to get a credit line draw of $5.5 million, and they were turned down by the bank. Oh, dear. Oh dear. Um, which was really surprising. Yeah. yeah, most of our clients that did this did it, did it several weeks ago, um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know a couple of them didn't realize that under item 203 of 8K, you've actually got a file. Yep. Uh, um, so we're, we have an, uh-oh, uh, you know, we're, we're relying on the non-compliance exemption. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, but, uh, but in any event, um, so anything else unusual that you guys are seeing out there um, that, um, you know, you know, stock halts, um, halts in trading, um, you know, anything to, uh, anything like that? Well, I'm certainly seeing it in the news and every day I'm on the SEC uh, mailing list. So I certainly often am seeing them come by and, and hearing on the news. None of my clients, thankfully, have been halted, and, but none of my clients are suddenly coming up with a COVID-19 cure when they didn't have one two days ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but I'm certainly seeing it, you know, we all see it. <laughs> Now, how about uh, how about MDNA? Um, you know, one of the things uh, this year was a, a healthy exercise in in you know dusting off the old guidance from 1989 and known trends and uncertainties. Um, you know, I, I, you know we were we were in the throes of that for clients that had. I have one client that has a year end in January, so we just finished up with that. Um, you know, th those that had uh, years years end in uh, ended in December 31 we're still running across it probably as they were uh, in the midst of filing a any uh, you know, any different type of disclosure that you guys have, uh, have sort of counseled on. For me, I think it's just what was discussed earlier, right? Um, there's going to be trends related to COVID-19, you know, whether your company is significantly impacted for better or for worse from it or not. So you really need to speak to those trends as part of your disclosure. And I, I think Laura addressed that point earlier. Uh, so but that's really yeah, the extent right. that I've seen it. And then I guess also to the extent your liquidity is affected, um, you know, you'd, you'd want to put disclosure in there about how, how the pandemic has affected your liquidity and how it'll look in the future. Um, you know, do you have capital? Do you have a revolver that you can draw down upon or something like that to help you through this time? Um, any additional, you know, we were talking about risk factors uh, earlier, and I think I kind of uh, interrupted Laura when she was going through some of that, but, um, you know, some of the additional risk factors, I mean, we, we have clients that have, um, and I'm sure you guys do too, that sort of are, uh, meet the essential business definitions of their respective states, and so they have, um, they have other issues, and I think, Lou, you talked about it, you know, what happens when someone gets sick, uh, what happens when your CEO gets sick, what happens when you have an outbreak in, in the plant. Um, any, well, first of all, God willing, none of that's happened to your clients, um, but I don't know if that's the case. We, we've had two clients that, uh, one of whom has uh, moved to um, infusion pumps. They're a contract manufacturer in the EMS space and they've moved to manufacturing infusion pumps, which are part of uh, the ventilator, a key part of a ventilator. Um, and obviously um, have, uh, have really started cranking those out. But early on in the process, uh, had four of their employees uh, contract COVID. So we were shut down, the state shut us down for, we went to the state, they suggested we shut it down for 24 hours. We shut it down for three days uh, and then cleaned the plant and put some people in isolation and so, knock wood anyway, nothing, nothing has transpired. Th that became an 8K event for us, right? I mean, that was a material, uh, uh, issue for us and our shareholders needed to know that we would not be producing anything for three days. Uh, has anyone run across that yet? Well, I've had clients that are non-essential businesses that are closed. I have one client in particular, they're, they have 42 franchise locations and all of them are closed down. And so obviously we uh, that was an 8K event to, to let the, the world know that they wouldn't be receiving income from those locations, but you know, all in all, like we have fashioned some broad risk factors with guidance for our clients. So what we did was we created a risk factor, and then we then we put in bold in different places. This is where you were going to talk about the very specific effects on your business to help get, guide them on what they need to think about and talk about in their risk factors. And we've done that for, for all of our clients that are reporting right now and that are working on reports that include risk factors, whether it's registration statements or 10Ks. How about interacting with the audit firms? How, how has that been uh, for your clients? As I mentioned, we had, um, you know, we ended up having inventory issues and we had to video it and, you know, um, had some, you know, had a drone come in and, and, and take a look. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm assuming that, that, you know, I don't, these things are going to drive uh, uh, issues on balance sheets that might require subsequent event disclosure, um, you know, inventory valuation. We've talked about impairment, but impairment of a lot of different types of assets. Uh, one of the ones that I've run across of late has been the deferred tax asset. Uh, you know, if you can't, if you can't take, um, if you're never going to take the deduction, it's no longer an asset, right? So um, we're curious if you guys have run across any of that at this point. Yeah, site, site locations, site visits have been an issue. Uh, I'm finding that the, the larger auditing firms are less nimble in this situation. Uh, a good, very good example is a client who has operations in France and their auditor just said, well, we can't go and we can't do a site visit. And so we can't access the books and records and, and do what we would normally do. So the audit's on hold indefinitely. And that client actually changed auditors to a smaller firm that is more comfortable logging in to the servers of the company to review the counting records. And, and what he said was, if I went to France, I would sit in a room and log into the server. It wasn't like there was inventory to look at. So why do I have to physically be there to log into the server? And their audit now is, is getting back on track. But yeah, there's definitely been audit issues. How about the regulatory? How about the financial services business, Lou? I know you, you've got some experience there, obviously, some significant experience. Is there any anticipated relief from FINRA on sort of like, I know uh, Reg BI is right around the corner. Uh, uh -huh. Any kind of help on the way or no? Uh, you know, um, well, one of the things I, I, I don't know, you're putting me on the spot and I, I honestly don't know the answer to the question, but um, one of the things I was going to say in response to your, your question generally about audit firms is in addition to having that issue, underwriters are having the issue. They can't do the site visits. And, yes. um, you know, so how are, what are they doing? And, you know, at least in one case, we're having, you know, video footage, live video footage being given to a group that's recorded and they're, they're doing a site video on like Facebook, uh, not Facebook Live. Uh, or maybe this How has that there. worked? Has that worked uh, okay? We'll see. The deal hasn't closed yet. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I would, I, would, I, would, I would argue it's still a due diligence defense, right? I mean, you've done the best you could under the circumstances. I think so, yeah. Um, so, well, look, I think we're running up against our time. Um, you know, uh, I know we were sort of all over the place here a little bit, but uh, frankly, um, you know, we're in the middle of a crisis and we're, we're addressing issues as they come to them. And I, I hope, uh, you know, this was as productive for you guys as it, I felt it was for me. I learned a lot from you um, and I really appreciate being in your company. You're, uh, you're a great group and uh, obviously a talented bunch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That's great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So I have one audience question. That, that audience question, that was, that was me. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, you guys, um, and, and depending on time, we may include this or not, okay. but, but um, you know, I know Laura and Jim, you guys alluded to this a little bit earlier and, and you guys ended up starting to talk about it here. But, you know, I guess I think it's pretty obvious and maybe not so much, but why, you know, the SEC has halted trading in a few companies' uh, uh, stocks. You know, a lot of companies are putting out news regarding solutions or a cure or treatment development, all sorts of things around COVID, you know, aside from just business update, right? So um, I'm just curious, and I know a lot of investors are, are curious, why would the SEC go through the process uh, of halting some of these companies? And then what is their requirements or criteria for them that, will then result in the halting of some of those stocks? Like, how do they verify it? I mean, if, if you, wanna, uh, you want I could... me to take it for a sec or anybody can. Please. If uh, you want me to take it for a sec. I think that those companies are fairly dead in the water. The only way that, unfortunately, you know, the only way that they're going to get back up and trading is if a new 15C to 11 is filed. And the only way a new 15C to 11 will be filed is if the SEC writes a letter saying that there is no longer, there's no pending investigation or that any investigation has been closed. And getting that letter is extremely difficult. Maybe 
in this case, if they're halting and then later find out that the company was dead accurate in what they were saying in a press release and that they, the SEC was just trigger happy, then they'll get that letter. But I'm going to venture to guess that that's not the case with these. I think the SEC at least took a couple of days to look at these companies. I'm not familiar with any of them, but, but you know, I'm thinking that those companies are pretty dead in the water. They're not going to be trading again. I wouldn't disagree. I, my only my only frame of reference on this is Ebola, and I had a client who had an, who had a alleged antiviral for Ebola um, that we were very clear on. We weren't sure if it was going to work, and we had a similar halting, um, at Laura, and um, actually had an investigation, and it took us about three months, but we ended up trading again, um, and uh, we were dead in the water for three months. And, uh, you know, SEC, and, and to Lou's earlier point, SEC enforcement showed up, knocked on our door, uh, dug through uh, our disclosures, and satisfied themselves that we were actually doing the best we could with rumors on the market to, uh, to tell everyone we, we didn't know whether we had this or not. And, and in, she, fact, we didn't. in your case, um, did the SEC start an inquiry or an investigation first and then yes. halt the trading? Because I, I, at least in my experience, and I think Laura also alluded to this, it's, I don't think they just stop trading. I think there's a reason for it. Right. So they, they've asked you a bunch of questions and you gave them answers that didn't, didn't seem right. Something's off. That, and so they correct. said, all right, well, now we're going to stop trading because we're worried about investors buying the stock. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then you try to go through the process and respond and you know, get the answers. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, They're not completely trigger happy. That's right. And what in our just our instance, just so you know, we had a promoter unrelated to us. We didn't even know who who was pumping our stock. Uh, and, you know, they came in, they investigated, they stopped. Uh, they ended up letting us know, uh, you know that the promoter was doing this um, and uh, and then let us resume trading. So did not. And we, we were we, they don't they don't exonerate anybody, but they went away. What, one more quick follow up to this also. I mean, you know, as maybe some guidance. So let's say there's an issue we're listening to this right now and they actually, you know, have some news that is COVID related in terms of, you know, what we've all talked about, cure, development, treatment, vaccine, anything of the sort. You know, would you say it's best practice maybe to run that news by your, your compliance first, your legal, everything first, just to make sure like, hey, this is what we got. This is what we want to do. Here's the release we want to put out. You know, I mean, what do you guys think? Absolutely. I, yeah, I think Absolutely. for sure. I, in, in, in the case with, with my client, um, you know, we, we got the letter from the SEC and apparently it's pretty routine um, to get these letters if you make an announcement and you have an ongoing offering or if you're publicly traded. And, um, you know, we, we immediately, I mean, I had reviewed the press release, their IR person reviewed the press release. And, you know, CEO called me up and said, what the hell is this letter? And we kind of went through the press release again, word by word, and said, is that true? Is that correct? Is that true? You know, and, and we, you know, after we went through it, we we're like, you know what, you know, maybe we could have said this in retrospect a little bit better, but, you know, it's 98% where it should be. We didn't say anything wrong. We think everything in here is true. And, you know, we don't have anything to hide. So, you know, then we, we went through and answered all their questions and they closed the matter. So. Um, you know, I do think it's a great idea. Anything, if you're going to say anything COVID related in your press release and uh, you're a publicly traded company, I would definitely have counsel review it. You know, and I don't know that that necessarily is different from hopefully what most of our clients do anyway. And that Every is when there's a material a press release, you pass it by counsel first to make sure you're not playing games. 100%. And also to have a due diligence file, and I tell clients to have a due diligence file and a press release no matter what, yes. but if it's going to be COVID related, have your documents and your, and your due diligence file put together up front. So if you get a call, and it could be from FINRA, Market Fraud Division, or it could be from the SEC, but that you have everything put together and can provide the, the backup and the documents like within minutes of the call. And, and I think that shows that you, you know, gives a lot of, of good faith and confidence for the regulator. And I don't know about you guys, but my experience with FINRA has always been, I always get a, I get a market inquiry from them and it's a list of who do, who do I know? Who do people, you know, who, you know, so-and-so traded, do you know this person? You know, kind of a inquiry. All right. Well, with that, um, we're right at that time. So thank you all so much for participating in this panel. Incredibly insightful. 
And uh, again, everybody, please stay safe. And I look forward to seeing you all in person soon. I hope, I hope to meet all of you guys in person. I very much appreciate your taking the time and enjoyed being with you. And stay safe. Thanks for moderating. Thanks, everybody. Stay Take safe. Care, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.